Good morning. This is Steve. And uh, greetings from Southern Illinois. Uh, today's talk is a companion piece to uh, the live stream of a Sabbath devotional entitled F Grace in a Toilet Bowl. Make sure you don't miss the story there. It will fill this full of meaning. But in text talks, we are examining Bible passages that undergird my perspective on the topics we've been discussing, which today is the topic of grace. So without further ado, let's settle in. Okay. I have my trusty Bible here. Um, this Bible has been with me since before the story that I shared today. So it's, it's seen a good uh, half a century of use and the wear and tear shows. But it's still my favorite Bible because um, despite the archaic language of the King James Version, that's what my mother had me memorize when I was a child. And it still is what flows in my brain the easiest. I use other versions, so feel free to use your own version today as we examine these passages. First of all, let's turn to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 5. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 5. This is the story of the entrance of sin into the human experience. Um, Adam and Eve do their thing, and then God does his thing. And in verse 15, he's speaking to the serpent, and he says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. What does this have to do with grace? Enmity comes from the same Latin root as uh, from which we get the word enemy. Basically, God is saying, there is going to be war between you, and I'm going to make it happen. And we've been killing snakes ever since because we missed the point, okay? This is a statement of grace. Theologians call it the covenant of grace, and it's not a contract. A contract says, party A will do such and such if party B does thus and thus. There is an exchange of commitments, but in the covenant of grace, there is no exchange. God is making a commitment. He's not offering a deal. Second passage that that is important to me in thinking of grace uh, is 2 Timothy 1.9. Now this is just one example of, of many passages in the New Testament that speak of this. So 2, 2 Timothy Verse, chapter 1 and verse 9. Now, today I'm not going to be going into the historical context or even much into the grammar. I'm going to be talking about what these passages mean personally in my worldview. Okay? So today is not so much about hermeneutics, how to approach the Bible, as it is a personal sharing of how the Bible affects me. So 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, Who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Grace was not an afterthought. <laughs> Grace was not an afterthought, a reaction to our sin, our behavior. Grace was a plan, a thought, a commitment that God had made before he even created the world. Before the world began, before I was born, 
before I committed my first sin and made my first mess, God had already committed to shielding me and bearing my burdens. He had calculated what it would cost to clean up my mess, to do away with sin, not only in my life, but in the entire universe, and was willing to pay that cost. He was determined to defend me, you, us, against all accusers, whether we were guilty or not. That's why the story I shared in the Sabbath devotional is so meaningful to me. It makes real for me the heart of God's grace that was prepared before the world even began. Second, now let's pop back to Genesis. Okay. Now we're just going to read one passage to get the full impact of, the, of what I'm trying to communicate here. You have to read the majority of Genesis because um, the majority of Genesis deals with the life of one man, Abraham. <clears throat> and what I want to, want to uh, point out to here, uh, what's meaningful to me is the the way that grace played out in Abraham's life. So Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, into a land that I will show you. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless you, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee all the families of the earth will be blessed. There's no mention of sin here. There's no mention of forgiveness, of enmity, warfare. How is this grace? If I would paraphrase what God is saying here, I would say, he's telling Abraham, you have a future. You have a future, a great future. His life goes on, and God keeps telling him this again and again. I'm going to make you great. You're going to have lots of kids. You and yours are going to have it all. Everyone around you is going to be blessed just because you and your children and your children's children exist. What we're looking at here is the heart of God's grace, not its muscle. But there's a fly in the ointment in Abraham's life. He got no kids. He has wealth. He has material possessions. He has influence. He has friends. He has followers. He's a blessing in their lives, but he's got no kids. How can he have a tomorrow? How can there be a future if it's going to end with him? You know, those of us who are on the tail end of life, who have finished our productive years, who, who are looking at retirement or enjoying retirement or enduring retirement, we understand this, okay? At some point, we stop thinking about tomorrow. That actually happens in people when people are in their 40s and 50s. They stop preparing for tomorrow. They, st they change their investment patterns. They stop trying to acquire new skills. Uh, they, they think that further education is somewhat pointless because what, what benefit are you going to get from it? Because in today's Western culture, we think our future ends when we do. Abraham struggled with this, okay? He starts to get old. It starts to bother him. He has a present. It's a wonderful presence. It's a wonderful present. But what about tomorrow? So he tries this and that, but just keeps making messes. And in the end, he decides just to leave it to God. And God says, bingo! The, boy, the Bible points out 
two reasons that God could fulfill his promise to Abraham in Genesis. The first is in Genesis 15, 6, and I'm not going to put that text up. We're not going to read it, but it's the passage where it says that Abraham believed God and God counted it to him for righteousness. <clears throat> Abraham put his trust in God. Okay, We're not just talking about intellectual belief. I believe that Pluto is out there. I can't see it, but I believe that Pluto is out there. Okay, That's not what we're talking about. When the Bible talks about belief, it's talking about putting our trust, depending, having faith in a person, the person of God. So Genesis 15, 6 says that Abram trusted God. He put his belief in him. Genesis 26, 5 specifically states that God could fulfill his promise because Abraham obeyed. In Western culture, we divide belief and obedience. I mean, you can believe something and not put it into action. You can believe something and still do something contrary to that. In Jewish thought, in the, the, the thoughts of the writers of the Bible, that was an alien concept. Because if you don't put your, th your belief into action, you don't believe. Because belief is trust, not an intellectual uh, agreement. And if you trust, you act. <clears throat> so let's pop forward to Hebrews uh, chapter 8 and verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Now, I found this bottle in the ditch outside my house. Somebody generously contributed it to our talk today. Uh, throwing it out the window as they went past. And th the outside has mud on it, and I've already cleaned it off a lot. I brushed off the leaves, and and uh, there was a slug crawling on it. Um, you know, it was a mess. But I've cleaned it off, okay? And um, I've, been, um, I've been digging a stump out in my front yard, uh, just a mimosa tree, okay? Nothing nothing spectacular like a big, massive oak. But I've been digging out this stump, and it's been hard work, and I'm thirsty. So I need a wa needed a water bottle, so I appreciate these people generously contributing it to me. So now I have my water bottle. I've cleaned off the outside, and I'm going to take it upstairs, and I'm going to fill it with water. You think that's a good idea? Oh, you think I should clean it? I should have cleaned out the inside of the bottle, not just the outside. Oh, why did I waste all this time cleaning the mud off? Okay, man, I should have just rinsed out the inside and put the water in there and cleaned it out. Yeah, I know I'm being ridiculous, okay? But that's how ridiculous we get when we talk about grace as either purifying our hearts or changing our behavior. Okay, a water bottle is not safe for me to use unless it's clean on both the inside and the outside. You don't wash your dishes on one side. You wash your dishes. And that's what God's grace intends in your life. Okay, the new covenant is not new. This, this passage that we read in, in Christian terminology, is the new covenant, God's new covenant, but it's not new. It's a restoration of the covenant of grace that God made back in Genesis 3.15, where he said, I will put enmity between you and the serpent. Abraham's dis descendants learned that disobedience leads to catastrophe. 
However, they became preoccupied with externals. They were busy cleaning the outside of the bottle. They wanted to look good. You know, and in Christian circles, that's something that's important. Okay, when we go to church, we want to look like Christians. We wash our faces. We wear special clothes. We want people to think of us as being good. Jesus put it this way in the Sermon on the Mount. Once again, I'm not going to put these supplementary passages up on, on, this, on the screen. But in, Genesis, or in Matthew chapter 5 and 6, what we call the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Jesus put it this way. You don't murder? Good for you. Your neighbors feel safe. But don't you call them stupid fools and idiots? Don't you understand that that is just as alien to my heart as murder? You don't cheat on your spouse? Great. I bet she loves you for that. I bet he really appreciates that. But you still laugh at dirty jokes, just like people who cheat. And when you're watching a movie and two people jump into bed when they've just barely met each other and before they've gotten married, you don't bat an eye. It's normal. Don't you understand that this is not what God had had in mind? That these are the seeds of sin that he said he was going to put enmity in your heart regarding? The new covenant is the old covenant. I will put enmity between you and the sin that so easily clings to you and insinuates itself into your heart and into your mind and into your thoughts and dreams and life. I will drive it out of your heart. That is the covenant of grace. That is God's commitment. That is his dream and his purpose for being a part of your life. For me, that's what grace is all about. Forgiveness is only one word in the story. It's not even the first word, but it certainly is not the last. Cleansing and transformation are where the action is, where the promise is, where the future is. Grace. Seek it. I'll see you next week.